Um, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, my name is Elspeth, and I'll be sharing. Um, yeah, so to contextualize this event um, as part of a wider series called Futures in Question, where we bring together academics and practitioners and look at different ways of imagining the future. So this session, as I hope you know, is on queer futures, so we'll talk about what it might mean to queer the future. Um, in terms of housekeeping, it's a hybrid event done using this weird owl thing and the, the microphone for the people online is here, so if the speakers could talk at it and when we ask questions later we'll have to kind of shout into it so that people online can hear us. Um, so we have two speakers today who will both speak uh, for about 30 minutes and then we'll have a little break and then we'll have discussion afterwards. So if you have questions, write them down while the speakers are talking and then we'll come back to them all at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, so Dr. Pip Gardner is the Chief Executive at the Kite Trust, uh, which is the charity that supports the well-being um, and creativity of LGBTQ plus young people in Cambridgeshire, Peterborough and the surrounding areas. Um, we're really honoured to welcome Pip here today. Okay, yeah. yeah, fabulous. Is that coming through okay on the mic? I should take that. Don't think fabulous. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name's uh, Pip Gardner. Uh, my pronouns are Z, or they, them. Um, I said I'm the chief executive of Kite Trust, um, working with LGBTQ plus young people um, locally. And um, when I was thinking about what my thoughts about queer futures were, it very much came to this idea of where what I, where I see that most resonant in our practice as a youth organisation is in camp. And so um, I'm going to talk about queer futures, our camp as camp, um, and how that uh, all connects, I think, from my uh, experiences. Um, so uh, in terms of my own identity, I am gender queer and gender fluid. Um, I'm a neurodiverse and sometimes disabled person. I'm a white British citizen. Um, and I grew up in Peterborough, um, have moved around the UK and USA, and now settled back in Ely. Um, so the area that I work with young people from, I very much consider to be um, kind of my home space. So in terms of my thinking about queer futures and camp, I think both have three core elements that are really intrinsic to the creation and the experiencing of both. Firstly, recipro <laughs> reciprocity within our environment and that engagement, uh, particularly with um, nature, creativity, and alternative experiences of time. Um, and so I'm gonna expand a little bit on these kind of three elements. Um, when I was thinking about this, there was a, a quote I came across, which I think speaks to all three of these elements um, from Bell Hooks. So queer, not as being about who you're having sex with, that can be a dimension of it, but queer as being about the self that is odds with everything around it. And that has to invent and create and find a place to speak and to thrive and to live. And so firstly, this section, the, the self that is odds with everything around it. And for me, that very much links into um, our experience of uh, reciprocal relationships with nature, both in queer futures and in uh, the experience of camp. I would dispute the, the sense of everything. What I think, what I see that everything is meaning is that the queer experiences is at odds with normative social scripts, with cis heteronormativity that very much positions queerness as unnatural. We see that so much and what uh, the young people I work with experience is they're being told that their identities are new, that they've been invented, that they are not um, natural um, in that sense. Um, and I think it, that really doesn't do, do justice to the natural world. If we think about the kind of healthy biodiverse ecosystems, they're full of queerness. And I think we need to understand that queerness is we're transcending binaries, we're embracing pleasure, not just functional reproduction, and we're creating interconnected communities of organisms beyond biological relations. And I think there's very much the rationale behind why these social scripts position um, queerness as unnatural 
links into the power that consumerist extractive capitalism has and that detrimental impact on our environment so much links to making a very clear claim as to what is natural and actually it claims some of the most unnatural things are natural and some of the most natural things are unnatural to propagate this system um, of power and i think we can we really understand now how much environmental sustainability <laughs> needs to be a key consideration in human futures for the future of our survival and so for queer futures i think we can see that being queer is at odds with the climate crisis not at odds with nature it's at odds with environmental degradation not at odds with the environment so when i think about that in terms of camp and queer futures being about reciprocal relationships with our environment camp is about a reciprocal relationship with our environment and it gives space for thinking about and experiencing living in a more reciprocal way through exposure to nature by going back to the basics of shelter, of food, um, of water, of spending time in each other's company and creating new social structures in which to engage with. And I think the ideas of queerness and ideas of biodiversity really do come together in LGBTQ plus camp spaces to help us to understand our place in the world now, our place in the world in the past and our place in the world in the future in a sustainable way. So then going back to this quote, I think it also has, has elements of what I want to say about creativity. So this idea that the queer self has to invent and create and find a place to speak and to thrive and to live. One of the, the, the biggest challenges that I see experienced by the young people that I work with, particularly uh, trans, non-binary, gender diverse young people, and that I personally have experienced, is that ability to envisage a future, or more specifically, envisaging the self aging into the future because we're lacking in that representation we're lacking in that those social scripts and we're lacking in the visibility of living older lgbtq plus queer people in our communities and that comes from different things that comes from experiences of the, the hiv aids crisis it comes from experiences of how that um uh, oppression of identities has happened over the last hundred years um, it doesn't mean that older queer people don't exist, but they are so much less visible to young people, especially still in their education in terms of what they see adulthood looking like for them. And so that lack of being able to see your own future and then the experiences that so many young people are having right now of present distress combined together to be extremely detrimental to mental health. Um, and I think we can perhaps completely relate that to the higher rates of of suicidality we see in our community because the biggest tool we have against suicidal thoughts is hope is being able to see our future um, and the more that that is suppressed the more it shows up in um, mental distress presenting as suicidality in young people and so this idea of of create queer is having to invent and create to thrive and to live creativity is a suicide prevention strategy and creativity generates hope and that space for being able to create our own futures and ultimately queer futures in and of themselves being creative um, and so creativity understand that, that i'm not just meaning we go on camp and we do some nice arts and crafts uh, in a tent um, i mean that in terms of the a broader understanding of creativity and here of um reference uh Bowden, who talks about creativity um that our model of the world is made up of, of a series of rules that govern that conceptual space available to us. And any form of creativity will reference those rules in some way. So we'll identify those rules, map them, explore them, or transport them, transform them. And so when we go into a space that is a, a residential space, it's a period of time that's limited, but it makes our surroundings completely different to maybe our day-to-day -day life. It is a creative space because we create new ways of living. We create temporary social structures. And in those structures, we can experiment with our identity and be creative um, in, in, intrapersonally. So creativity with our own identities. And we can create what chosen families and how we uh, differently understand our social relations and our interpersonal creativity. Um, and I'm not disparaging of arts and crafts because I think that's definitely 
actually also part of that process because it, they can be tools that give particularly young people that those skills and that appetite and that confidence for engaging in creativity. And so it is it enables that value in creating and finding a place to thrive and live. And it creates that hope for the future because not only do they see that they have the tools to uh, make some kind of uh, like and so patch to make uh, a shelter in the woods, but they learn that actually what they take from that are what may be more widely labeled as soft skills for creating their own futures going forwards. And then so coming back again to another element um, of this quote, queer as being. And so I can question and come on to kind of the experiences of time. If we think about queer futures, are we actually thinking about queer futures or are we looking for pasts and queer pasts? Because actually we've, we've had this period of queer erasure and we've told so much that um, queerness is new and different. But actually if we go beyond some of these power structures that existed in recent history, there's so many examples of queerness throughout human history. Um, and so I think we need to kind of clear our understanding of time from this sense of linear narratives of constant progress. It's not necessarily new or better, and that embracing queerness is a new thing that um, is part of this kind of innovation and development of society. Actually, we've always been here, and we need to think about time differently, that so much of what we need for our futures existed in the past and not lose, lose sight of that. And when I was thinking about um, kind of experiences of time as well, um, if anyone has ever been camping and particularly large youth group camping, the sense of how time passes in that space is different. There's the sense of you become a lot more aligned with the cycles of the day um, because so much around daylight governs what you can do um, at what times. Um, but also so much ha can happen in a condensed period of time and so little. So my example of this, we took, um, we took 14, uh, 13 to 18 year olds camping um, in the forest uh, last summer in the midst of a heat wave. And <laughs> to, to be fair, like they coped extremely well with it, but to do anything in 33 degree heat is quite an ask. And actually, if you looked at like what productively happened in that time, a lot of laying under trees in the shade was what happened in that time. But what happened in that time also was some incredible friendships that in the space of 48 hours, these young people went from being um, very shy, very socially anxious, not wanting to talk to anybody, to being the most outgoing and engaging because they felt comfortable with the people they were around and they built those relationships through being in that space. And I think there's so much that I have learned about youth work practice in, in a camp context that you just have to focus on being in that space. It's not about accomplishing anything else other than spending time together and meeting our basic needs of getting a meal cooked uh, in a reasonable time frame, of making sure there's access to water and access to um, washing, although limited take up by some teenagers. Um, and just having that sense of, it's dark, now I'm gonna go to sleep. It's light, I'm gonna spend time with the people who I'm in this space with. Um, and to very much queer as being and camp as being. And so, yes, that experience of time differently, of saying actually queer futures are already here. Time, we understand it is cyclical and not this linear sense of progress. We're constantly remaking what came before and queerness isn't new. Queerness is there throughout the past. And so we've got elements of essentially utopian queer futures already existing in those pasts if we have the tools and the means and the attention to find them and look for them and bring those to the forefront of our awareness. And what I very much learned from uh, engaging in, in youth work practice, particularly in the camp space, is that camp is a space to explore prototypes of queer futures. It very much brings those skills of creativity, those skills of actually being able to sit with the idea of aging and growing up in terms of what that means when we're engaging with the natural world, not what that means when society's expectations are layered on us. 
is so empowering for a young person who is constantly hearing those narratives around them of things that they are struggling to achieve and that is uh, causing them distress. To be able to see it actually, living means something different if we just look to, to the natural world and to being um, as the core examples of that. And yeah, I just want to kind of leave it with, I think that queer community building has existed throughout time and camp is the one of the ways in which we continue that legacy and that we are building queer futures already. And that is not, uh, it's not a distance thing, but it's already here. Um, and I think that's really important. And I find that every day really important to share with young people that it's not about envisaging the future of some distant thing where we all live in space and um, like it feels really disconnected from where we are. The future is just one minute ahead of us and we can make that all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Pip. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Susie Bauer-Brown, um, who's a lecturer in social psychology at the Thomas Forum Research Institute at UCL. Um, her interdisciplinary research has studied the school experiences of gender diverse adolescents, as well as the social experiences of trans and non-binary parents, as well as two mum families. Um, so please join me in welcoming Susie. Uh, yeah, thank you very much um, to Elspeth for organising tonight's event and having me to come and speak and to all for making it out in the sleep. So, you know. um, yeah, my name's Susie, I'm a lecturer at UCL, but I still live here in Cambridge, so it's really nice to be at an event in Cambridge. Um, I'm a social psychologist um, and my research focuses on LGBTQ plus identities and diverse family forms. Um, so I first became interested in this research field when I did my undergrad dissertation here in Cambridge on the experiences of children who've got trans parents. Then I did my PhD on trans and non-binary parents and um, gender diverse adolescents as well. Um, I've since done other qualitative research on two mother families who've used assisted reproduction and people who approach parenting in kind of unique ways, so people who seek a co-parent online. Um, so my research is focused on young people who might just be kind of figuring out their identity and also on parents who I think are at a kind of another stage of identity change and development as they figure out what being an LGBTQ plus parent means both to themselves and their children. And so I'm really interested in this idea of queer futures. And to me, this brings up a number of different questions. What does it actually mean to queer the future? Um, how do queer people imagine their futures? What constrains the futures of queer people? And how can we support young people to imagine better futures? Uh, to me, queering the future is something that's relevant to everyone, regardless of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Queering the future means challenging normative assumptions about how we should live our lives and giving people choice and freedom to live their lives in authentic ways. Um, so I'm going to talk about queer futures um, using a life course approach. Um, so the life course perspective is an interdisciplinary kind of approach that examines the factors that shape people's lives. And it's based on some key principles. So firstly, that we develop throughout our lives rather than stopping at the arbitrary legal age of 18. Um, secondly, that our experiences are related to historical time and geographical place. Um, Thirdly, that our life forces are embedded in our relationships with other people, be that either social support or stigmatization. And finally, the theory states that we all have agency, which I think is really key. We're uh, capable of influencing our lives and our futures. So I think it's clear that there are certain assumptions about what a kind of good or acceptable life looks like. Maybe it's kind of going to school, going to university, um, focusing on your career in your 20s, then finding someone, settling down, marrying, having children, 
and then working until you retire. Um, and this has been referred to in queer theory as chrononormativity, or the assumption that one particular life course is the right one, and this is the same for everyone. Queer people have challenged this expected life course. Jack Halberstam writes that queer uses of time develop in opposition to the institutions of family, heterosexuality, and reproduction. And within this idea of chrononormativity, I think there are a number of other kind of intersecting normativities. I know I won't have time to obviously speak about them all today, but I'll speak about the ones that are most kind of relevant to the research I'll present. Uh, so firstly, the idea of heteronormativity, that um, being heterosexual is kind of the best and ideal way to be. Again, cis-normativity, the idea that being cisgender is the best and ideal way to be. Another one that's perhaps most relevant um, for people aged 30 plus is, is this idea of couple normativity. There was a really interesting book published a few years ago called The Tenacity of the Couple Norm. So even when these other norms are becoming maybe uh, they're transforming slightly, the, the idea that you need to find a couple and the couple's the kind of best, healthiest way to be is really very prevalent. And finally, reproductivity is very much tied to couple normativity, basically the assumption that everyone should be a parent. Um, so today I'm going to focus on two stages within the life course, um, adolescence and parenthood. Um, I think these two time points are interesting for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, as I said before, there are times of identity change and identity development, so perhaps particularly useful to study identity at these points. Secondly, I think there are points when people are um, often engaging with institutions. Um, so, for example, adolescents have to go to school every day, and parents might have to engage with certain institutions, such as um, maternity wards or adoption um, spaces, as well as kind of spaces on a more day-to-day -day basis, such as mother and baby groups or their children's school as well. Um, so. Yeah, my plan for today is to speak about my research on gender diverse adolescents, um, then research on trans and non-binary parents before reflecting kind of generally on what queering the future means. Um, so thinking first about adolescents, this is some global data from a survey um, by Ipsos. Um, um, and yeah, I think it's clear that uh, Generation Z clearly are identifying in um, different ways. So they're much more likely to identify as non-heterosexual and much more likely to identify as non-cisgender. And in terms of gender, what we're particularly seeing an increase in is the number of non-people um, identifying with a non-binary identity. Um, here are some examples of identities from participants in a survey that we did of young people. So trans girl and trans boy, that might be what we call binary trans identities. And then non-binary gender fluid and agender were the most common non-binary identities used. However, that wasn't the only identities that young people use. And here's, I think, a really nice, um, yeah, just such a nuanced range of identities. Um, and I think it's clear that young people are querying uh, the present. They're finding increasingly nuanced ways to describe themselves. So demigender, egogender, magi boy, demigirl. And I think it's really clear that we need to allow for this possibility, this fluidity and nuance in gender identification. And um, so in terms of the research on gender diverse adolescents, there's a really large body of evidence now demonstrating that gender diverse young people are at risk for poor mental health. And the statistics on suicide are shockingly high. Um, research also demonstrates really high rates of bullying at school. Um, and there are some suggestions that these, the, there's an increase in bullying. And um, this survey from LGBT Youth Scotland found that bullying had gone up from 2012 to 2018. And I imagine this will have gone up since. I think it's really clear that the current really hostile media and political climate is having an impact on young people's everyday lives. And there's been a number of studies linking discrimination um, to mental health issues. And this is consistent with a minority stress perspective, which suggests that having a minoritized identity and experiencing discrimination 
is inherently stressful, and this leads to the higher levels of mental health issues that we see. Um, it's not just bullying. Um, I think research often focuses mainly too much on bullying. Um, lack of family support and institutional discrimination are also very much related uh, to mental health. And these factors are all very much intersect. So one study in the US found that trans and non-binary youth with gender restricted bathrooms are more likely to experience sexual assault. So that shows the link between in institutional discrimination and other experiences that I think we need to explore more. Um, clearly it's very important to focus on these negative outcomes so that we can work out how to support young people. But I think that focusing too much on these outcomes can suggest that they're kind of inherent to gender diversity. And we need to allow for thinking of young people as agents, not just as kind of victims of discrimination. And um, Cal Walton writes that we need to raise our ambition for gender diverse young people. How can we support them to thrive rather than just hope that they survive their teenage years? Some really interesting research is starting to be done. So one um, survey in Finland found that quality of friendships were associated with well-being for trans and for cis youth. And chosen name use and access to gender affirming care is also associated with better mental health. And activism has also been found to have a positive impact on LGBTQ plus young people's health and their feelings about their identity. Now I'm going to talk about um, yeah, my research and what we found. And this is a large survey conducted in collaboration with Stonewall of over 2,500 LGBT young people. Um, but I focused on a much smaller subsample so that I could analyze the data qualitatively. And the reason why I'm using gender diverse as an umbrella term there rather than trans is because a number of the people responded no to the question, are you trans, but did identify as non-binary. Um, so yeah, I focused on binary, trans, non-binary and gender questioning young people. Um, and I did a qualitative analysis of the open-ended questions in the survey. So what are gender diverse, I was focusing on these questions. So what are gender diverse adolescent school experiences? And how do they navigate the school environment? And I was looking at these processes of identity threats and identity work, which I think is summed up well by this quote from a participant. So it sucks, but I try to remain proud. You know, just threaten the environment, but I do things to overcome that threat. So in terms of threats in the environment, and these took the form of kind of two different things. So categories and constraints within the environment, and then the role that social others played as well. So in terms of categories and constraints, um, young people spoke about how the school environment just wasn't suitable for their identities. So an agender person said, my school is very binary. I feel I can't come out of the school as they wouldn't know what to do with me. And the lack of, um, I'm sorry, these gendered spaces were particularly difficult for gender questioning young people. And um, so a gender fluid slash questioning person said, I used to have a running streak of weeks. I would cry after PE because I was stuck in the girls changing rooms. But it's probably better with the girls than with the boys. Their own uncertainty about where they wanted to be made things much more difficult. Um, in terms of social feedback, peers and teachers had a really kind of strong influence over young people's experiences. There were really high rates of bullying, but I'm going to focus just on teachers today. And um, so teachers were found to be in a kind of unique position to either help or hinder young people who are experiencing bullying. And some teachers, like the experience on the left, actually legitimised uh, transphobia from others. So some staff are okay with me being trans, but a, min a minority say insults and use the wrong pronoun on purpose. When they complain about being insulted, the other teachers, they feel that everyone's entitled to their own opinions. Um, and there was evidence in the sample of teachers perhaps trying to be supportive, but actually restricting the autonomy of young people. So they refused to let me present the way I identify, and refused to let me use whatever toilet I would like. I wasn't allowed to change my name or gender on the register because of fear of being bullied by other students, despite my protesting. So young people had a range of different strategies for negotiating for navigating these kind of identity threats. So one of these was uh, negotiating disclosure, and um, so deciding how to come out, when to come out, whether, whether to come out. And unsurprisingly, this was found to be quite stressful. 
So if I out myself at school, I'll be forced to change schools because I know I'd be relentlessly bullied. I'm afraid that if I make one wrong move, I'll end up outing myself to everyone. Um, and the most kind of effective identity work strategy um, was definitely this idea of proactive protection. So building an LGBTQ plus community at school and also engaging in activism as well. So as someone with a gay friend, a lesbian friend, two bi friends, a trans friend, and some very strong opinions, I stick up for all of them. <laughs> um, and participants were often at the forefront of changing school policy. So I wore a skirt and my science teacher asked me to stay behind after class and said how boys might think it's okay for them to come to school in skirts if I was wearing one. This is now different and I'm allowed to wear both skirt and trousers. So young people were clearly resisting at school and changing the environment both for themselves and future um, queer young people. Um, I thought it'd be um, interesting just to highlight some of the suggestions that young people had for how we can improve the futures of gender diverse youth at school. And um, so a lot of the time young people said that policies were often reactive and individualized. And they spoke about the importance of proactive policies. So the school should accept that some students are trans, whether they decide to come out or not. Young people spoke about the importance of teacher and pupil education. So the more, more education there is, the better things will get. And inclusive spaces and uniforms. So it really helped if we had unisex bathrooms. And at my sixth form, there isn't a uniform, so it's much better. Um, so now I'm going to speak more about parenthood. Um, so it's clear that young, more and more young queer people are actually choosing to be parents. And the parenthood gap between LGBTQ plus and non-LGBTQ plus people is narrowing. So um, more cisgender heterosexual people are rejecting parenthood and more queer people are choosing parenthood. There's also some evidence that um, young people are choosing different routes to parenthood. Um, so a survey in the US found that 70% of trans and gender non-conforming adolescents were interested in adoption whereas only 36% were interested in biological parenthood. Suggests that young people might be kind of querying and challenging expectations that parenthood is always biological. Um, but it's clear that young people's imaginings are also constrained by normative societal expectations. And um, young people report fear of discrimination within the adoption system, and also uh, report maybe a kind of reluctance to go down the trans pregnancy route or non-binary pregnancy route as trans pregnant bodies are seen as unintelligible. Um, so yeah, we conducted a, a qualitative study of 13 trans and or non-binary parents in the UK. Um, and we explored parents' social experiences. So how did they navigate parenting spaces? And importantly, we did a kind of intersectional analysis so how do parents' unique identities and multiple aspects of their identity impact upon their experiences? This is a, just a picture of the results. Uh, but generally parents saw parenting spaces as kind of highly normative and they use different strategies to navigate these. So being a pragmatic parent and also being a pioneering parent, which I'll explain with some quotations. Um, so yeah, generally parents saw parenting spaces as a highly normative world. So this was highly gendered. So being a parent has really brought me into contact with a huge amount of quite painful cisgender policing. And so I've sat in a lot of quote unquote mother and baby groups and felt massively others. And um, parents also spoke about exp expectations that mums exist, dads exist, but that's it really. So you don't see families like yours on television. There's not cards for happy non-binary parents day. And that can be difficult just feeling like you don't exist. And these kind of assumptions have very wide ranging impacts. So Erin, who's a trans woman, spoke about um, her experience of trying to access maternity leave. So I didn't get very much maternity leave because I was only entitled to paternity leave, which was a big downer, especially when I'm trying to breastfeed my child. They said, oh, because you're down as father on the birth certificate, it came down to that. And participants spoke about their experiences um, in a kind of intersectional way. So Kim spoke about being rejected from a fertility clinic. Um, and this was because there were trans parents in her family, uh, there were disabled parents in her family, and there were also more than two parents in her family. 
So the first clinic we went to rejected us for what we considered to be spurious grounds that would probably break the equality. We felt it was a little bit eugenic, to be honest. And so I think it's really clear that different normativities kind of intersect. There's a couple normativity, cis normativity, and ableism as well. And so for this kind of discrimination, parents often use pragmatic strategies. So um, using disclosure and also avoiding spaces. This was found to be quite frustrating. So Gemma said, there were times when I was upset because someone didn't use the right pronouns, but I didn't make an effort to make them use them or make them say them, which I think was more frustrating for myself than for other people. Um, Robin spoke about avoiding um, adoption and surrogacy. If I went through these routes, I'd be subjecting myself to systems that weren't designed for me. It would potentially be quite scary and unpredictable and might just reject me outright. And Charlie spoke about the fact that pragmatic strategies weren't necessarily available to them as a non-binary person. So the advice that the organisation were giving was to make references to transness in my adoption profile, because that's what's worked for other trans adopters, ad adopters. Whereas that just doesn't work for me because of the pronouns that you throw out. So parents also about using kind of pioneering strategies. So attempting to queer spaces and change them for, their for themselves and for other parents. So I just remember getting really annoyed going through the entire pregnancy file they give you, crossing out anywhere it said mum and writing parent in black Sharpie pen, trying to get the point made. And Erin spoke about being um, inspired to change spaces for others. So importantly, we try generally not to tell people um, our child's sex, we're using they. We quite like to normalise doing that so that other parents feel that they can do that and have the choice and it's not a big thing. And Amal spoke about um, feeling very motivated to increase representation of diverse trans people and trans parents. So I don't really know of any other South Asian trans people, least of all parents. So if I get myself out there, there's going to be someone else who sees me in case that person looks like me. I consider myself to be a trans parent in more than one way, not just to my son, but to younger trans people. Um, and um, parents spoke about the importance of protective spaces. Um, as kind of doing these pioneering strategies we found to be tiring and stressful. So I actively seek out queer spaces where my child, my child will see families that have stuff in common with us. So either around gender and sexuality or race or all three. And home was found to be a really important kind of protective space. So there's no toxic masculinity in this house. My son's allowed to have his emotions. He's allowed to be upset. There's no manning up and we wear nail varnish because we're fabulous. Um, so it's really clear that participants um, kind of changed expectations around what parenthood meant. For some parents, this was very kind of deliberate. So we all grew up in a society which tells us there are differences between mothers and fathers. Being a queer parent and queering parenting is something that I do both consciously and unconsciously. And Max kind of described the tensions involved in uh, doing this and in imagining a parenthood that perhaps they haven't seen before. So I suppose I feel a sense of freedom. There's nothing particular I have to do or not do to be a gender queer parent because I don't know any. So I don't have a model for what that is, which is sometimes really terrifying, but also very free. And so just to kind of sum up um, my thoughts on what queer in the future means, I think that queer in the future is about challenging normative assumptions about identities and uh, the life course. And I'm not kind of challenging the standard life course itself, it's the assumption that that is right for everyone. And I think within this, we really need to center reproductive justice and social justice. So reproductive justice is based on three rights. So the right to have children, the right to not have children, and the right to parent children in a, self, a, self, a safe and healthy environment. I think that's really, really key and expanding that kind of more broadly to the idea of social justice. Um, I think that normativities are particularly prevalent, uh, perhaps when engaging with institutions. So I've spoken about school, I've spoken about parenting spaces today, um, but I think we really need more research into the experiences of LGBTQ plus people in the social care system. So what's it like for a young person to grow up in the care system? Um, and if you think about the other end of life, what's it like to be an older LGBTQ plus adult 
going into a care home. I saw recently that London has its first um, LGBTQ plus retirement village, which is really exciting. Um, and yeah, I do think that career in the future is something that is relevant to everyone. Um, and this is from the Mail Online last week, which is a good, you know, um, good news source. Um, but <laughs> some stories from women who are, you know, rejecting um, motherhood. I just think querying assumptions about what lives should look like is really relevant to everyone. So thank you very much.